started. Um, the first thing I want to ask is, um, let's see. Um, I can record this meeting and send it out to the lister, but if you don't feel comfortable with that, I don't need to do it. So do you think the possibility somebody might, Scott says no. Any other ups or downs? I think it would be great, but. Scott, what's your problem? A lot of work for people and it wouldn't be used very much. Whatever, that's well, my thing. It's thinking. not any work. I mean, it's just clicking a button. Okay, but if you have to, someone has to go type it up and stuff like that. No, 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 no. It's a recording. It's like I, it's a Zoom meeting that's recorded. Okay. It would do well, it automatically and I just send out the link. I, whatever you guys want to do. Okay. I will keep it on then. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, we're very pleased to start out today, as you saw on the agenda, with our new board member, Leo Alanak, who is going to talk to us about LGBTQ. Uh, language and other issues. So hit it, Leo. All right, let's see if I can share my screen here. Oh, can you make it so that I can share my screen? Wow, no idea how to do that. Can't you just do that by going to the bottom? You, uh, you disabled it. Make her a co-host. Oh my God, make host. I'm gonna make you host. You are now the meeting host. All right, cool. Thank you. But you may need to admit people if it doesn't allow me to do that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, hit it. All right, let's see. Okay. All right. So this is an introduction to LGBTQ plus language. Um, I'm kind of starting from the basics because I don't know, this originally started as a conversation about um, pronoun use, um, but um, I wanted to kind of start with the basics because there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of changing terminology and whatnot. So my name is Leo, the pronouns I use are he, him. Um, and so, yeah, so let's get into it. So um, language is constantly changing, especially, um, with uh, social media, the, the speed of change is, is, you know, going even faster. So if you're more familiar with outdated terminology for certain things, that is, I'm also going to be referring to that to let you guys know that it's outdated terminology. It's totally fine. Our understanding uh, should be fluid and uh, open-minded. So, all right. So we're going to start off talking about just a brief explanation that, you know, Gender and sexuality are different things. So um, everything that we are taught about gender and sexuality uh, is through the lens of white Western ideas and colonization. It is not inherently correct. It is a very specific uh, ideology um, that was brought over by European colonizers. So that is something to be aware of here. Um, it is not inherently the binary nature of both that we are taught is not scientifically accurate either. Um, gender is a social construct. We created it and every culture has a different definition of what it means. Um, and sex as in the biological aspect is not binary despite what I was taught in school. Um, so male and female as terms are associated with a set gender expression, a gender identity, and a set of biological definitions, but this leaves out intersex people. So gender identity is how one identifies, and sexual orientation is who you experience um, emotional, romantic, and or sexual attraction to. So people who are intersex are born with sex characteristics that do not fit typical binary motions of male or female bodies. Uh, they make up 1.7% uh, of the population. Um, it is a common myth that intersex people are rare. Um, and that's, that bias is really proven in the fact that um, most people don't even learn what intersex means. Um, it's an umbrella term used to describe a wide range of natural bodily variations. 
Um, some traits are visible at birth, um, while in others they are not apparent until puberty or may not be physically apparent at all. Um, it's a very personal thing. Um, it's not something to, you know, ask people about. It's obviously something that people will, you know, share if they want to at their time. But um, it's important to understand, kind of break down our understanding of binary sex because, you know, it's non-existent. So um, I will also, just as a side note, I will share this presentation with everybody. I'll just like send it to the email chain so people can look at it more in detail um, because I've added some charts here and whatnot that's just interesting. And there's um, links to where I found all these resources so people can dive in more at their own time and pace. So cisgender, um, if you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth, you are cisgender. Simple as that. Uh, contrary to the beliefs of some on the internet, cis is not and has never been a slur. Um, and uh, another term is transgender. So if you do not identify with a gender you were assigned at birth, you are transgender. So the older term that some previous generations may identify with is transsexual or going even further back is transvestite, but these should not be used by those outside of the trans community. Um, in terms of nuances of language, something I hear a lot is the term transgendered. Uh, it's not something that happens to someone. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an identity, it's not an action. Um, and in writing, um, sometimes people will combine uh, trans, like trans man, and they'll make it into one word. But trans is an adjective that should uh, be treated like any other adjective. It's uh, just describing someone's gender identity. It's not about, you know, saying that they're a, a different quote unquote type of person, if that makes sense. So, all right. So pronouns, um, ask, don't assume, uh, and offer your pronouns first. Um, it can be a little awkward if you don't offer your pronouns first because it can feel uh, that you are kind of, uh, it not, uh, not kind of being somewhat intrusive if you're just trying to figure out, you know, like what someone's pronouns are to possibly out them. So it, it's always good to offer your own pronouns first. Um, common pronouns are she, her, hers, he, him, his, or they, them, theirs. Uh, and there are other pronouns in other languages as well. Um, I think the gender neutral pronoun in Spanish is ella pronounced or spelled E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but I could be wrong about that, but other languages have gender neutral pronouns. Um, neo pronouns, meaning new pronouns, are increasingly in use as well. Um, so this is something to uh, pay attention to and respect, um, you know, just because they're unfamiliar doesn't mean they are any less valid. And a lot of people will put their pronouns in um, their email sign off or their Instagram bio, which is a great thing to check out um, if you're gonna comment on somebody's post to make sure that you, you're you know, using the, the correct pronouns. Uh, some people use multiple pronouns. So some people will say, this is my name, my pronouns are he or they. And so it's always good to, if that's the case, mix up your usage, that's totally fine. That's, when, that's what's been requested, so. Um, so non-binary is considered a uh, part of under the transgender umbrella, um, but they do not identify uh, as one of the binary genders. So non-binary is in itself an umbrella term uh, that, identi uh, that includes identities such as genderqueer, agender, gender fluid, etc. Gender identity is a uniquely personal and sometimes cultural uh, thing, as is the case with the term two-spirit. So two-spirit is defined as another gender role believed to be common among most, if not all, first peoples of Turtle Island, um, one that had a proper and accepted place with, within native societies. So it is widely recognized as a, an umbrella term um, for indigenous people who do not identify as cisgender. Um, and I, I call two-spirit an umbrella term is because there are, you know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of tribes that have different terms that have, you know, different languages. And so it's, you know, it is an indigenous umbrella term, but some indigenous people may not identify with it. Um, yeah. Ooh, 
jumped ahead here. All right, so two important notes. Trans people identify with a variety of sexual orientations as well. There is a common misconception that if you are trans, you are also gay or you can't be trans and gay. There's a lot of weird misconceptions, um, but there are gay trans men, there are trans lesbians, there are bisexual trans people, and there are straight trans people. Um, gender and sexuality often intertwine in a lot of ways, but they are also ultimately two separate things. So you, you know, just because you're one doesn't necessarily mean you're the other. And thankfully this, I don't believe this is as common of an issue anymore as I think people are becoming more aware, um, but don't ever ask trans people if they've had the surgery. <laughs> um, one, this is a private medical information and it's nobody's business. And two, trans people can choose to have any kind of surgery. Um, there's um, facial feminization surgery, uh, facial masculinization surgery. Um, there's other surgeries that you may be more familiar with, um, but there are multiple different kinds. And also some trans people choose not to go under surgery. Um, and it's ultimately just about respecting boundaries and not asking um, because people should be allowed to do whatever they need to, to feel more comfortable in their own skin. So other terms, these are getting a little next, like leveling up a bit here, um, but just trying to get, dive into more um, trans related terms. So AFAB is a common um, acronym and it refers to assigned female at birth, AMAB assigned male at birth. Um, so, uh, trans, so trans masculine is a more inclusive way to refer to someone who is AFAB and might be non-binary or a binary trans man. And the same goes for trans feminine. HRT refers to hormone replacement therapy, which is something that some trans people choose uh, to uh, undergo and some don't. It is, you know, just dependent on what they prefer to do. Um, passing is a term uh, that refers to the outdated notion um, that means uh, whether or not a trans person passes as the gender they've transitioned to. But this obviously is problematic because gender expression is another layer on gender identity. And it also excludes non-binary people because there's no, I mean, there's no one way to look, there's no one right way to look like a man, but there's especially not in society's eyes, a way to pass as non-binary. Um, dysphoria is a common term. Dysphoria or, uh, is the shortened version of gender dysphoria, um, which was previously, I don't know if it still is, in the DSM as uh, a psychological issue. Um, but while not, it's not a prerequisite to being trans, it is commonly associated with gender and feeling out of place or uncomfortable uh, in one's body. Misgendering uh, is what happens when you refer to someone with the wrong pronouns or their dead name. Please correct yourself and correct people when they do this, but do not make a big deal out of it. It can be really uncomfortable if you accidentally um, say someone's old name, which is their dead name, um, or use the wrong pronouns and then make a huge deal out of it. Then it becomes about yourself. You know, it's important to apologize, correct, and move on. And it's equally as important to correct other people if you, um, if, if you catch them uh, making an error. Um, it can be uncomfortable and put trans people in an awkward position to constantly have to, you know, be the only person advocating for themselves. And finally, uh, drag. Uh, it's a form of art and performance that expresses, kind of pokes fun at, and dramatizes gender. Um, it's not to be confused with identifying as trans, although there can be some overlap. They aren't exclusive. Um, the uh, the most, uh, a lot of trans people started, uh, dra drag was started by trans people um, basically as a way to express gender before um, it became more normalized as a everyday thing rather as something that um, only needed to be done at a at, like. Uh, I need to time. interrupt because there's somebody's trying to get in. Can you oh, yeah. let them in? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm if I can find it. You can go to chat and say allow. That's the easiest way to do it. Go to chat. Oh, there we go. Do you find him, George? Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, the probably the most famous drag person uh, that most of you are familiar with, if any, is RuPaul. Um, and there have been some uh, transgender drag queens um, on that show. Um, and recently a trans masculine, uh, trans mass guy um, is on this newest season and doing drag. So drag is ultimately open to everyone. Okay, so now we're switching over to sexual orientation and terms that are probably very familiar to you. So queer uh, is a reclaimed slur. Uh, it's more uh, inclusive of a word than gay, especially for people who are queer in a gender and or sexuality sense. Um, lesbian refers to non-binary people or women attracted only to other, that should say women, not Oh, this is what happens when I copy and paste. <laughs> um, only attracted to other women and or non-binary people. Um, and same thing for gay. Uh, it is also sometimes used as an umbrella term similar to queer, but is generally associated more um, with uh, sexuality rather than gender. So bisexuality. So some people, this is kind of an ongoing intercommunity argument um, in terms of bisexual versus pansexual. Uh, some people will say that bisexual, bisexuality is inherently transphobic or non-inclusive of non-binary people, but this has not ever been true. Um, the best definition of bisexuality is that you are attracted to genders similar to yours and different than yours. Uh, for some, Leo, uh, gender Leo, is a... F Leo, can everybody else mute because there, there's some feedback happening? If everybody else mutes, it will probably eliminate that feedback. I don't know who's uh, unmuted still. Ooh. All right. Is it, I think it's gone on my end. Is it gone on your end? I'm just going to continue. Um, so for some people, gender is a factor in attraction, uh, and for some it isn't. Um, and it's also important to note that bisexuality is not inherently a 50-50 split in attraction. You know, um, it's there's a lot of complexities to that, and it's fully dependent on the person. Um, pansexual uh, can be interchangeable with bisexuality, uh, and it is more commonly used than bisexuality amongst Gen Z. So it's kind of, it's not a newer term, but it is being more commonly used. Um, however, it still stands as its own in being defined slightly differently as attraction regardless of gender. Uh, and then asexuality is little to no sexual attraction, but you can still have romantic relationships. Um, another term that I didn't write on here is aromantic, which refers to people who don't have romantic attraction. There's a lot of um, again, multiple identities under the asexual umbrella. Um, and while asexuals are often excluded from LGBTQ groups, they should not be. Um, and historically they have been included. It's kind of uh, an intercommunity issue, uh, more recent in terms of discussion, but they are part of the queer community. So that's basically it. So be respectful, speak up, language evolves, and the most important thing I can tell you is to keep learning. Um, like I said, I'm going to send this out um, to everyone, but I found, I kind of took some uh, really cool books here for people to look into. Um, I highly recommend, because each of these books has so much information, um, I highly recommend just choosing at least one that looks interesting and just diving in. Um, and if you want to check out um, more uh, YouTube, or there's YouTube channels as well. Oops, someone. Um, and then there's also uh, Instagram accounts as well if you'd like to follow any specific people. Um, but yeah, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to answer anything. Um, yeah, I hope this was uh, helpful and reasonably clear. <laughs> Leo, thank you so much for the effort you put into this. I appreciate yeah. um, that you're going to send it out to us because some of it was a little small on the screen and we can look at it. Gotcha. Um, okay. Okay. If you switch me back to the host.
I am. And then I'm going to entertain some questions, but I need that um, gallery view. Do you know yes. how to do that? Yes. Oh, okay. Looks like you did it. Okay. Um, so unshare your screen. Okay. Um, if you have any questions of Leo, uh, please unmute yourself and ask him. I just want to say that um, I really appreciate this. And this came up because of another meeting that I was at where somebody's pronoun was they, and there were three men that argued about it and were really rude. And I didn't want that to happen in our group. And I also asked Leo, how do you put your pronouns by your name on Zoom? And he taught me how. So if anybody wants to do that, you have to go to your Zoom settings to add your pronouns. So thank you, Leo. Are there other questions? Okay, I'm going to move. Thank you, Leo. That was, I really appreciate uh, the effort you put into that. Um, we're going to go to Sarah next because um, Sarah White um, is going to, is a uh, guest speaker. Thank you so much for coming. And she's going to update us on what Sheltering Silverton has been doing. So hit it, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, very much for that information. Um, Sheltering Silverton is in this weird place right now, like so many other organizations and, and groups in the community. Um, we're trying to deliver our services to people who rely on having a space to have physical needs met. So it's really hard to do, it's, there are barriers to doing that during the pandemic. Um, we've moved into a building that was created uh, or made available to us by the Cypher family. Um, we're in the old Sandy M Tractor Supply Building. Right now that will come to an end when the property sells um, sometime, hopefully for the family soon. Um, but we anticipate we'll be there for another couple months. And so we're operating our daytime resource center there every afternoon from one to five. Clients can come in and get a hot meal and snacks and clothing and gear. They can take a nap um, in that space. We have enough room that we can really safely spread out and socially distance. Um, and then of course we're doing rigorous case management, uh, trying to help folks move into housing as soon as possible, which it's really challenging right now because there, there are a lot of resources, funding resources, but there are just no affordable housing opportunities um, or not nearly as many as we need. And a lot of the shelters in Salem and the broader area have had to shutter just like ours have or reduce their capacity to allow for social distancing. Um, so the shelter crisis in our region persists. Right now, I would say our numbers are a little hazy and debatable because it's really hard to count and keep track of a population that is as fluid as um, the houseless population. But I think we have about one shelter bed to every six to 10 individuals who experiencing experience homelessness. Um, so it's woefully inadequate. Normally, many of you know, we run a warming shelter um, and have for the past four years out of churches in the community with COVID, the determination was made that we did not have a facility that was safe enough to socially distance and that that was not a smart route for vulnerable populations. So we moved our funding around and were able to put people in hotel rooms. Um, so we have two ways that we can put people in hotel rooms. Folks who are um, seniors, people who have disabilities or chronic health challenges or who are sick with COVID or other illnesses like respiratory illnesses that could potentially be COVID. Um, and families with children will be sheltered on any night of the winter in a hotel room or a long-term like Airbnb. Um, right now we have five rooms at duration rooms booked at the Silverton Inn um, for people who've been particularly seniors and people with disabilities. Um, and then for the rest of the homeless population, folks who are younger and generally a little bit healthier, we are able to shelter them in hotel rooms when the temperature falls to 32 degrees or below. Um, so 
that's kind of how we're keeping people safe as best we can. Um, the pandemic has motivated us just as much as anything to work even harder to get people into housing. And I'm really happy to say that our numbers are really low this year. Um, we kind of worked our buns off last winter and summer and we're down to having only 30 people who are unsheltered in the community. And um, we've tried to connect as many of those people as possible to vehicles. So at least they have, they're off the ground if they need it on particularly challenging nights. Um, we have an additional about 20 people that are, who are housed, but um, in danger of homelessness that we continue to work with as well. So that number's reduced significantly from about 100 people from about a year ago. So um, yeah, we are also working to advocate for more affordable housing options in Silverton. So I serve on, uh, and several people who are connected with our organization serve on this uh, city's homelessness and the affordable housing task force. Um, that affordable housing task force is moving ahead with some great recommendations for changes to our municipal code that would allow um, developers to bring more housing to the community. That is in conjunction with a state law that passed and went into effect in January, I believe. Jason, you can probably correct me on that. Um, but that frees up code language so that, for instance, um, historically on a residential single family lot, you could only build a single family home and this state law requires municipalities to allow duplexes and triplexes to be built on those lots. So it should increase the inventory of housing in the community. We're looking at a lot of other things like there's a joint work session coming up between the Planning Commission and the Affordable Housing Task Force this next Thursday, I think. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Jason's my spotter tonight because <laughs> your eyebrows will indicate if I'm wrong or not. But um, we'll be talking through our uh, task force's recommendation for priorities. We have a huge list of code changes that we recommend and we've had to, as a task force, go through and identify top priorities and try to recommend those to the Planning Commission. So we're continuing that conversation. Um, many of you are familiar with the St. Edward's Cottages Project, um, where St. Edward's Episcopal Church up on the near the hospital um, worked hard for a couple of years to build four cottages for women. Um, those are complete, they're beautiful, they're empty, and that's frustrating, but um, there have been some leadership changes at the church. The priest, uh, Shanna McCauley, has moved on to a new church in Portland, and her vacancy leaves kind of this gap, and so they're waiting to open the program until they get a new priest at the church. Um, we are partnering with them to provide support for the women who will move in there, but we can't really push it ahead without the church. So hoping that comes to pass quickly. Um, our organization also received CARES Act funding um, thanks to some advocacy from the city. And we were able to purchase four pallet shelters, which are these emergency shelters that are substantial enough to keep people safe and warm can go up pretty quickly. Um, and we have those now in our possession. We're looking for a site to place them. We're in conversation with one church about potentially putting up the four of them to serve as emergency shelter in the spring. Um, and our organization would support them and um, provide case management and help for folks that are there. So those are all the things that I know. Sarah, thank you very much. <laughs> And Sarah does an amazing job. This is volunteer and she has four children. I have no idea how she does it. I'm not really sure you're from earth. <laughs> well, I'm not um, a volunteer. I wanted I to clarify that. that. I'm paid <laughs> now. So thank yeah, you. And then you invested in Joy Farm. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to say I wrote a book. I interviewed about 40 people um, last year from all the different organizations that were helping out. And it, I decided to just give it away for free. So it's a www.smalltimehomeless.com. And I encourage on that website that Mike Ashland did, thank you very much, 
um, to give donations to these organizations. And I think one of the great things to do is to say, huh, what could I do a month? Let me just click it in there and do 10, 20, 50, whatever I can do and set it up um, to give to Sheltering Silverton. And it's a great way of providing them the support they need. So Sarah, thank you very much. Are there any questions of Sarah? Yes, Lori. That planning commission meeting is Tuesday at six if anybody wants to join. <laughs> thank you, I would have been two days late. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna do a really brief summary of bingo cards. Sustainable Silverton, which is an uh, organization that created a plan, an energy plan, uh, so how to be more sustainable, be more eco-friendly, and the city adopted it. One of the teams we have, and I wanna give Elise Hughes credit for this, is uh, bingo cards. And what we are developing is a bingo card that has all the different things you can do beyond bins. We all do our bins, but there's other things you can do to assist in this effort of sustainability. And what we're gonna do is we'll have a booth at the farmer's market and we um, just send out letters to 200 members of the Chamber of Commerce to ask them to be a sponsor, to donate something. And I wanna give Lori Carter credit because she was the first one who responded. And that'll be, as I said, in conjunction with the farmer's market and there'll be some prizes and raffles and different things like that. And obviously it's a way to engage the community as well as educate the community about these issues. So next I am going to call on Jason Freilinger um, who is gonna talk about the city manager hiring process. Thank you, Jason. And just real quick, uh, in reference to um, Sarah White's conversation, that the new duplex law uh, law takes effect in uh, July first, um, so it's it's coming up. Um, so the city manager process is, uh, of course, the overall structural idea is similar than the past, but of course everything is different because of COVID. And um, so we had seventeen applications. Um, the council is going to be meeting um, the 8th and the 10th, and really we're just looking at taking out some people that are, are just not qualified or just not competitive qualified to narrow it down to, we think it's probably gonna be five or six people. And this year, this time around, um, we're gonna be having four panels. And the fourth panel was um, uh, something me and the mayor worked, worked out in regards to, because I kept saying, I want all these people to be involved in the process. And he kept saying, well, we don't have room. And so we ended up making a fourth panel. So there's gonna be a panel of um, staff. There's gonna be a panel of uh, partners. And these basically are C CEOs of like the school district, the fire district. Um, I believe Sarah White was invited, but maybe Hillary is, I don't know if Sarah's doing it or Hillary's doing it. Um, somebody from SACA was invited. And so that's the partner organization. And I was trying to get people onto that but I was trying to get too many people onto that. So um, the council will be one of the panels and then the final panel will be a community panel, which is, you know, they're not, they're not heads of any organizations or anything like that. They're not in government. They're just people that wanna be involved in the process. We're really stressing that there's gonna be a big time commitment to be a part of one of these panels. Um, we wanna make sure that people aren't coming to, into this, not realizing that, but it's gone out on social media. Um, I sent it out to Silverton Progressives. Um, you can still go to the city website if you're interested in doing this. And so next week we will be determining, we don't know how many people are gonna apply. It's probably, you're probably looking about a total of eight hours worth of commitment. Um, Leo and Charles have told me that they've already uh, put their names in the hat. Um, and, uh, but uh, you know, we'll have, I'm sure we'll have room for more people. Uh, the interview process, which is um, basically step three or whatever in the process, will, will be taking place February 16th through 18th. Um, it'll take all three days for all that to take place. At the uh, end of the day on the 18th, the council will probably be narrowing it down to our two final candidates. 
And then there will be a something that's been in the past. There'll be a meet and greet, but because of the COVID age, um, that'll be different. Uh, just by the way, all the panel work, all of that, everything is going to be done via Zoom. The entire hiring process is happening via Zoom. So, so after the uh, panel interviews, there's going to be a meet and greet, and people will be able to interact in an informal way on Zoom and just ask questions and talk to to uh, these people that uh, the final two candidates. Also at that time, the mayor and I are gonna be um, interviewing uh, for these last two people, um, the folks that they work with back in their, wherever they're at right now. Um, so it used to be we'd travel to those cities. Now we're gonna be asking them to attend a Zoom call where we'll talk to them. And uh, we'll probably be looking at making a final selection uh, sometime in March. And um, because the, the notice expectations for a city manager level candidate are long, we're probably looking at the position being filled by mid-April. So um, that's that it in a nutshell. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions? I don't see any hands up. Thank you okay. very much, appreciate it. Okay, now we are on to the open forum. So if you have something that we haven't covered that you'd like to do, please, or ask or comment on, please raise your hand and unmute yourself and I will call on you. That can't be possible. No hands are up. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi. Megan has her hand up. I didn't see. Yeah. Megan, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm not. Okay. Um, I just want, I'm sorry I came in so late. I had something happening. But anyway, um, I um, just want to report that Seeds for the Soul that we had discussed two months ago um, is putting together a whole packet of material for us to look over and review and see if this is a project we might want to take on, hmm. uh, providing solar to um, installations for uh, low-income homes in Silverton. And they have an amazing program going on in Corvallis. Um, we had, she presented for us, Julie Williams did, and I was been in touch with her twice. She said they're putting together all the materials, um, everything from contracts to forms that people fill out to procedures for how they solicit people to um, take on the projects and how they find installers to get involved and that sort of thing. So I haven't seen the material. She, she did promise it for January 31, um, but um, I'm sure there's a lot going on to get it together. So as soon as I do get it, I'll look it over and then I'll let you, you all know it's come in and whoever's interested in seeing it, um, I'll forward it. So that's where Thank that stays. Much, I, have a, I have a question for Susanna. I bet she can update us. Uh, I, I read that kids are applying for DACA status again. Anybody have any okay. comments on that? Oh, uh, can you hear me? Susanna, yes, we can. Uh, I was very excited um, in December. I thought, well, now all the kids that uh, were uh, left out last time, they can apply for DACAs. And really, I was talking with Fernando a couple of days ago and also with Barbara, my daughter. She's an attorney in Salem. Uh, we didn't have many. I will say from January till, till today, maybe seven uh, consultations and only five applied. But you know what is the problem? Is uh, there are two key day, uh, dates that uh, are involved in the process in DACA. One is June 15, 2007. And the other one is, no, 2007, yes, and June 15, 2012. And the kids that apply right now, they were maybe two years old when they came in 2006, 2005. And the parents just came and they don't have any proof that they were here in those days, at least in 2007. 2012 is fine because already they were in kindergarten or first grade or second grade. 
but we can't prove that they were here in 2007. And I think that is one of the barriers for them. And the other, the other one is also the ones they were 30 years old in 2012, and now they are, uh, I would say maybe 35, 40, and they cannot prove so many years, 20 years to be here. It's like a complicated, but uh, yeah, I didn't receive many uh, new DACAs. The other, the other thought is maybe they are waiting for the new administration to do something else and they are waiting, uh, you know, maybe thinking that something's going to happen the next month or in the next, next hundred days. Um, but, you know, what I try, look, I never did this. This is just one DACA. And, uh, and this person brought like these papers. Uh, there are no money to anybody to work through or, you know, a package like this. But I really want to help these people. And I work maybe days for just one case. But I know this person, for example, has three kids and there are, she has no options. If it's no with DACA, she has no options. And, um, you know, I don't care, I do it because I, I know I'm helping them. Um, but it's, it's getting hard. Hopefully, it's going to change those dates because if not, they, nobody can apply. It's, it, it, there are some, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's like a puzzle, you know. Um, and was working okay when Obama put a, set up the program, but it's not working okay now if they don't change the dates. Yeah. But Susanna, I'm thank saying, you for all your work. Are there, are there questions of Susanna? Other comments? Sarah? Susanna, thank you so much for your work. Um, I was wondering if you're working with any families who have family members who've been subjected to separation and um, what you're no, doing them. No, no. Uh, we, sometimes we have calls from different states um, for Colorado or Arizona, they, uh, you know, we are in contact with different agencies, and, but not in, in this area. No, not in this area. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, I think we can all be very happy that Biden was elected president. <laughs> Scott, you had a comment. Yeah, I didn't quite understand Susanna entirely. Is the fees for uh, citizenship, the naturalization, is that going back down? I know it jacked up 50% uh, in the last year. No, you know, um, I, I have... A lot of people applied for naturalization last year in 2020, even though the pandemic, uh, I would say maybe 40 people came, but they were freeze. Was no interviews, no nothing. No, they, uh, they didn't do fingerprints. That is good. They used the, the fingerprints they were in record, but no interviews. And right now I have people waiting from December 2019, and right now they have the interviews, but it's moving along. The people wait for one year and to, yeah, 14 months, but now they are, you know, setting up the interviews. That is very good. Yeah. No, it was very bad, uh, the, uh, all the person-to-person uh, -person meetings in Portland all were canceled. But right now, they are moving along very well, very well, Ra rapidly, I will say. Uh, I, sometimes I have uh, clients, several clients the same day, I start at 7 in the morning, even though one was 6.45 in the morning. And I have people doing the interviews uh, late in the afternoon, 5, 5.30, before was just... 10 till noon and that's it. But because they are so be, um, um, behind, 
they are doing very well with the, uh, all the interviews for naturalization. And they are very good people. All the officers are, they, they want people, uh, you know, go through the process and be successful. That, that's a good thing. Okay, are there other, thank you very much again for your work. This is such an important issue. Um, are there other comments? This is a, Lori. Just real quick, um, our, we have two candidates uh, that are running for school board. We're still looking for the third, we're waiting. We have somebody that's a maybe, and I'm supposed to hear back from her this week, and this week is gonna be ending pretty soon, so I hope I hear back. But um, one does need help with website design if anybody is uh, qualified to do that. Um, and we, I'm going to ask for questions for the candidates that we can, we, I want to give them the questions ahead of time, have them write out their answers, it will be sent out to the group, and then everybody will have a chance to read it, and then we'll have them on, and we can do follow-up questions in person. So you'll be getting an email. And we will have them, those three candidates, hopefully three candidates on in March. And Deb Patterson from the Senate is also going to update on some of the legislative activities in March. So I, I just want to thank you all for participating. Um, for a small town, this is just a great group of people. I will send out the recording to the list. So people who didn't have the opportunity to participate this evening can see the recording. Are Michael, there any Michael, other comments before we end? Michael has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to especially thank Leo for your presentation because it's so important. And one of the most important reasons that it's important for all of us to become more aware of our own language and, and uh, all that is that you may not know, but the, the rate of suicide for those who yeah. are transgender and the rate of murder against those who are transgender is really high. Um, and it's very challenging for families. And because of how divisive our country is right now, when a family is struggling with uh, transgender uh, members of the family or attitudes towards others that are um, you know, their allies. Uh, it's important to have resources to help that nobody feels like they're alone. So in the chat, I put a couple of links. Um, one of the links is a suicide hotline. If you know anyone that's in crisis or that has family members who are struggling, you can um, find it at the Trevor Project. That's a phone line, it's a chat, you know, um, texting on any way that people can get help, they provide it all. And um, the other thing that my family has found especially helpful is the Transactive Gender Project up in Portland, which is specifically a support group for families. Um, transgender is not, an adult exclusive thing. It's, it's kids, you know, it's families. And this support group has been a great resource for my family, um, for as parents and as kids. There are age, different age groups that kids can, can meet with and uh, leaders who have uh, experience and who have um, wisdom that they can share to help. So again, if you know anyone a family that is in need of that kind of support. It's actually through the Lewis and Clark Graduate School now, hmm. connected with that. And I also put a, a link in there for that. And last thing is, I'm moving to Illinois. <gasps> so I'm sorry to believe in you all and, and I am really uh, appreciate being welcomed into the community and making my little contribution. And um, selling my home on South Water Street and my family's out there already. So I'll be joining them as soon as our house sells. So. Michael, thank you very much for your comments. Are there other comments? Uh, yes, go ahead, Lee. 
Yeah, just a couple of other brief things because Lori is going to be focusing on the uh, our neighborhood leader program countywide again reached its peak in November with over 300 uh, volunteers working on getting out the vote and actually Marion County, which voted for Trump uh, four years ago, voted for Biden this year. So that, that was a victory. And um, countywide, there's some exciting things happening in the school board races. Uh, Salem-Kaiser School District, as you may have heard, there's a huge coalition with Bakun, the unions, social justice organizations, all working together to get four candidates elected to the Salem-Kaiser School Board, including three Latinx individuals, and then Ashley Car uh, Car Carson Cunningham that ran for uh, county commissioner. So um, there'll be room for, and we'll be looking for volunteers to help support those races. But we're also researching that there are actually 11 school districts in Marion County, um, eight or nine of which are ignored by the rest of the county. And I, I've been reaching out to all the small school districts in Jervis and in Turner and in Aurora, et cetera. And what I've found is of all the 42 seats that are open this May for new people, um, two thirds of those are Republicans, independents or, or, or not affiliated, one third are Democrats. So if we can get Democrats throughout the county working harder to get more Democrats elected in those nine other school districts that we aren't working on, uh, will help to build the foundation of a stronger neighborhood leader program, a stronger progressive movement in Marion County. So stay tuned for details from that. And if you're neighborhood leaders, stay tuned to hear from Lori about what you can help uh, do to help on the Silver Falls School District uh, elections. So that's an update. I want to thank Lori and Lee. They do just an incredible job. And um, the Neighborhood Leader Program, if you're not a part of it, join because it's so doable. It's like you get a walk in your neighborhood. You have a limited amount of people. You walk, you leave a flyer, you call them. It's really easy to do. So are there any other questions, comments? Shella Swa had her hand up. Oh, Shella Swa, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Go ahead. Uh, well, I like put it up for a second and then put it back down and figure it out at, at night. <laughs> Um, so I, yes, I, well, one, I just wanted to say hello. Um, good to see you guys. Uh, it's been a while. Um, cause I started a new job at the department of education, um, working as a coordinator for the African, African American black student success program. And, um, and we meet regularly with the other coordinators for the American Indian Alaska native program and, uh, the Latinx program. So, um, a lot of kind of exciting stuff going on there. Um, so I, I know there are some, um, like I don't know what the percentage of, uh, but Latinx students in, in Silverton, I don't know when their RFA is coming up, but I know we'll, we'll be posting um, like new grant opportunities in, um, in the spring. And so um, that might be something to kind of put on people's radars as they're kind of brainstorming uh, things that they could do to support kids uh, in your areas, your respective areas, um, and really emphasizing partnerships and, and working together um, on that. So community organizations, community organizations and districts, stuff like that. Um, and on the effort uh, that Lee mentioned, I have been, <laughs> um, working with that with with that group of like part of the first set of conversations and, and putting that coalition effort together and it, it it's really pretty awesome I, I must say um it's yeah we um went through you know have a, a ton uh and, and a diverse variety of community organizations working together um you know i i, I had a few introductory comments uh, on some of our earlier uh, big group meetings um, to really emphasize to people that let's focus on the things that we can agree on, um, you know, and acknowledging that there are some groups in the coalition that other groups, you know, disagree strongly with. Um, 
but uh, but we're not going to separate because of that. Because some people had said such things, you know, like, oh, if I'm the problem, then I'll leave. Like, no, 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 no. No, I'm, I need you to stay and help. Um, and so we don't all have to agree on every single thing. But the one thing we can agree on is that we need better people. We need better people serving our kids. Um, and so I, I need you to stay here and do the people power, you know, to make that happen. Um, and so like Lee said, we have, we have there's some, some really excellent candidates. Um, if, if you guys are, if anybody is interested, I can send you, we're doing a campaign kickoff, uh, I think um, next week. Um, so if anybody's interested, I can you know, forward that along to the, to the listserv if anyone wanted, and wants to attend that. Um, and if you have friends, you know, that are in this area, um, I know, or our revolution group, um, Central Willamette Valley uh, Revolution will be doing a candidate forum. So if you have friends that are in Salem Kaiser, you can share that with them. Um, and I'll put in the link in the chat here. Um, also, um, I think what we've named ourselves as uh, Community for Salem Kaiser Schools. Um, and I put in the, the chat our donation link. Uh, so we formed our PAC um, a few weeks ago. And so that's ready to go. And what the PAC is doing is helping to run the coordinated campaign. Um, Pakun is doing, um, is, is really kind of spearheading that. And Reyna Lopez of Pakun is the chair. Um, and uh, another lady, I can't remember her name. I think she's from Stand for Children as one of the co-chairs. Um, not as not like Stand for Children is a co-chair position, but she happened to be the person who had the time, um, you know, to serve as co-chair. Um, and so we've been able to do polling. Like we had a campaign meeting tonight. Our campaign meetings are every Thursday night. Um, and so we've been able to do some polling, which was amazing. It really, it was really you know, gave a lot of, of information. Um, so even as you guys are, you know, continuing, because I know I have learned a lot from y'all um, and on the efforts that you guys did with school board in, in um, previous years. Um, but if you're you know, ever interested in some of this stuff, that's like, you know, we as a, as a community are just, I, I feel like just moving, you know, we're just growing and we're growing in our knowledge or growing in from one another and learning from one another, you know, on, on ways to attack this. And so um, the polling that was shared today uh, and we've got uh, pages up to sign up for, um, you know, calling for any of the candidates. Um, so there's a whole schedule. You can commit to like two days a month, you know, or more frequently if you want. Um, Right now, since some candidates, you know, haven't yet uh, set up their their web pages and their Act Blue sites and all that stuff, um, the donations to the PAC, you know, can also be used to assist them um, in their startup funds. So, like Ashley, you no, know, doesn't need as much help as some of the other ones starting out because Ashley still had money left. Not to say don't, don't donate to Ashley. Yes, donate to Ashley. She's amazing and awesome. Um, but she's a little bit further along than some of the other candidates because she had money remaining and she's already got, um, you know, a platform set up. But anyway, just saying those are some of the things if um, anyone's interested in donating to the pack that that money would go towards. Chelisqua, um, I would like to put you on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, we will have candidates from Silver Falls School District for Silver Falls School District. And I would like you to talk a little more about that. Is that okay? I'll contact you. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's yes. That's a very interesting topic we're interested in. Okay, anything else? Going once, uh, going twice. Okay, thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it. What a great group. Okay, bye.